Thank you very much for the very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure and an honor to talk uh, here and tell you a little bit about what this title means, Saving the Quantum, how to make friends with the environment. And I decided to keep uh, this colloquium very general, just to give you the main ideas. And please, you can stop me anytime for questions. And if you prefer, after the colloquium, we can go in more details um, of whatever is the theory or experiments I'll be talking about. Uh, as Camille said, I come from Turku. Turku is approximate. Oh, no. I have to learn how to use this one. I think the central one is, the, is no, doesn't work like this. This is the pointer, yes. So Turku is approximately here. Here is Helsinki, and I commute. Generally, once a week, I go to uh, Alto University in Helsinki. And uh, Finland is famous for three things. It's summarized in these slides that, unfortunately, you can't see. But basically, here, there would be sauna. This is Nokia. And what you don't see here, it's really impossible to see, is some heavy metal. These are the three main, most important, uh, popular things um, in, in Finland, that characterize Finland. Um, I want to talk about three things. The first one is something that has to do with this sentence, environment is the enemy of quantum technologies. This is because very often when you hear about quantum technology, people say something like decoherence induced by the environment is the major enemy of quantum technology, is the reason why it is so difficult to build large scale quantum devices. And the second question, the second point I, will, I, will, I want to discuss is the sentence quantum reservoir engineering. What do we mean with quantum reservoir engineering and how is this related to the action of an environment on a quantum system or on a quantum device? And then the third point will be related to so-called memory effects. And this is what is connected to non-Markovianity, and I will explain these terms during my talk. The main idea will be to actually provide some examples and some justification to the fact that perhaps it is not so true that decoherence induced by the environment is actually the main enemy for quantum computers. And how can we use the environment itself to fight or to create more efficient quantum technologies and quantum devices. But we begin with the first point, that is environment is the enemy. What do we do if we have an enemy? We try to understand it. And this means in particular, in the case of decoherence, to model open quantum systems. So I will begin by talking about some general formalism to model quantum systems interacting with their environment. So generally, what, what, what we mean or what we um, define as an open quantum system is a quantum system of any type interacting with its surrounding. The surrounding can be quantum or classical. Uh, and generally, the, by definition, the system is what we are interested in. So what we want to do at the very beginning when describing open quantum system theory is to identify what our quantum system is tracing the boundaries of the quantum system. And this is probably what we can measure, or it could be a part of something, and this is the first step to start defining the wall formalism that will allow us to describe uh, open quantum systems. So examples of environment, as I said, everything I'm going to say will apply both to the case of quantum environments, for example, quantum electromagnetic field surrounding an atom, but also to the case of classical environment. So to the case of, for example, stochastic noise. We will try to develop a formalism which is quite general to describe uh, both types of situations. And when we talk about open quantum systems, generally what we do is to define um, a density operator describing the open system. And all of the open quantum system theory descriptions start from a main assumption. This assumption is that the state of the system and the state of the environment initially do not share any correlation. Okay? So these are the product state of system and environment. The total system initially, at the initial time, 
is in this product set. This is an assumption that sometimes people forget, but it is at the base of all, at the basis of all the formalism of open quantum system, or, or the major part of the formalism of open quantum systems. And then, of course, as time evolves, correlations are established, and then in this case, we can talk about a total density operator for the total system, which is not anymore in this factorized form, due to the presence of classical or quantum correlations between the two. And what we do is that then we can perform a partial trace over the environment and talk in, term, in terms of the density operator of the system, which evolves in time, okay? And what the theory of open quantum system does, what we are generally interested in, is precisely understanding how the state of the open system will evolve in time due to the interaction with the environment. So this is the whole uh, general background. So we are interested in dynamics. And when we think in terms of dynamics of an open quantum system, generally we have what I call the king and the queen of open quantum system theory, that are the master equation and a dynamical map. So the master equation is the equation of motion of which this is the solution. So it tells, it, it is really the equation of motion for the state of the open system. And the dynamical map uh, is the operator that is related to, the uh, super operator related to that. I will show it in a moment. So dynamical map is this super operator that I indicate with lambda t, and it gives me the state of the system at time t for any initial state of the open quantum system, okay? And Generally, the way in which we call it is, is, is uh, as following. So this is a family of quantum channels parameterized by time. Quantum channels are completely positive and trace-preserving linear maps, and this is not just a quantum channel, but it's a whole family parameterized by time with the uh, initial condition um, of this type, okay? And then we have the master equation as I said, is the equation of motion. I write it quite generally in terms of this uh, uh, Liouvillian uh, or Limbladian operator lambda t. And of course, as you can see immediately, the connection is, is rather clear because in itself, the dynamical map uh, is just satisfied or, or is just subjected to the same equation of motion with the initial condition given by this one. So as a matter of fact, the dynamical map is just the chronological ordering operator of the exponential of the integral of the Liouvillian or Limbladian, okay? Or also known as dissipator. Now, the most famous theorem in open quantum system theory is the so-called Limblad theorem. It's known as Limblad theorem, but actually the correct name should be Gorini, Kosakowski, Sudarshan, and Limblad theorem, because at the same time, Gorini, Kosakowski, and Sudarshan and Limblad proposed papers uh, in which they described the properties of this master equation. Uh, and um, in, in the case of the Gorini, Kosakowski, Sudarshan, Limblad theorem that I will describe uh, in more um, detail uh, soon, what happens is that actually what we will assume is that this Liouvillian L of t is not explicitly time dependent, okay? So we are just assuming the absence of a time dependence in the Liouvillian, and this means that the dynamical map takes a much simpler form, which is the following, okay? This, of course, has to be understood in terms of the um, Dyson series, clearly. This is a super operator here. So you're probably familiar, or at least some of you are familiar with the form of the equation of motion um, known as the Limblad form, and it is the following. Hmm? So it has a unitary part where H is the Hamiltonian of the open system, and then it has a part which describes the dissipation or defacing. And in this part, here again, rho is the density operator of the system, of the open system. And this constant here, this gamma case, are positive decay rates describing how the system decays in the different decay channels. Okay. Uh, these operators here are known as the jump operators or Limblad operators. And this is 
a milestone in open quantum system theory because it turns out that the solution, if I start from an initial condition which is a proper state for the system, the solution of this equation will always be a proper state. Okay? So I'm always automatically, you know, I have this guarantee automatically that this is a good form of an equation of motion. Now, this is what people in the past have identified with the concept of Markovian open quantum system dynamics. It's this equation, it's the Limblad equation. But what happens if we try to generalize a little bit the equation that I showed you before? So what happens is, is actually the Liouvillian becomes now time dependent. Okay? What I mean in particular, for simplicity, will be the case in which this decay rate will now be time dependent. In principle, I can also add the time dependencies in the jump operators, okay? It's, it's the same. I will, for simplicity, consider only this, this case. And obviously, also the Hamiltonian can be explicitly time dependent. I didn't write it here, but it is, it is not a problem. Hmm? So what happens is if these uh, decay rates are now time dependent. Well, what happens is that whenever they are positive, or rather non-negative, the Limbla theorem still holds. Yes, question. Yes, the Limbla theorem characterizes uh, the equation of motion for a semigroup dynamical map. So whenever you have a semigroup, a dynamical map which is a semigroup, this is the only form consistent with a completely positive and trace preserving dynamical map. So it guarantees trace positivity and complete positivity uh, of the dynamical map. Okay? <coughs> and it's an if and only if condition. This is the only form of a semigroup which is completely positive and trace preserving. And this is true also when the decay rates uh, are non-negative. What happens to the dynamical map in this case? Well, in this case, instead of having, we were discussing just before about this semigroup property for the dynamical map that we can simply uh, write in this form, so the composition here S is a time instant smaller than T, so the composition of the dynamical map from zero to S and uh, from S to T is just given by the dynamical map of T plus S. So semigroup property, uh, because not necessarily the inverse, generally the inverse uh, of the dynamical map uh, is not completely positive. So it is not a group, because the, the inverse does not belong to the family. <coughs> what happens if I assume a positive time-dependent coefficient in the form of the equation of motion, the semigroup property becomes generalized to the following form, okay? It is known as divisibility, and it just says that I can compose the dynamical map in the following way. Now, instead of having a one-parameter family, I have a two-parameter family, which is known as the propagator. So the, the dynamical map from zero till time t is given by the dynamical map from zero till time s smaller than t and propagated through a two-parameter family which is always completely positive. This is known as divisibility property, okay? And this is an if and only if with a Limblad form with positive time-dependent coefficients. So this is a, a little uh, bit of a generalization of the previous concept. And this is why we still call that master equation as Markovian. But what can happen is that the decay rates may in some cases become temporarily negative. And in this case, this equation of motion is what we identify with non-Markovianity. The problem is that when this happens, the Limblad theorem does not hold anymore, okay? The consequence of this is that we can still be in a situation in which we can solve 
this equation of motion, but the solution of this equation of motion may not be physical. What does it mean? For example, that the operator, the density operator, which is a solution of this equation of motion, may not be positive. Obviously, we need to have positivity of the density operator. Okay, so we still have an equation of motion, but we do not have the guarantee of physicality. Okay? When I talk about physicality, I generally mean here complete positivity uh, in, uh, of the dynamical map, which is associated uh, or which is always guaranteed by the Lindbergh theorem. Okay. So what happens in the, in the case of negative decay rates, what happens is that the propagator lambda of Ts will not be completely positive. Okay? By definition, the dynamical map is always completely positive because I define it as a t-parameterized family of completely positive maps. But it is not said that the propagator has to be completely positive. And indeed, what, what will happen in the non-divisible case is that I lose complete positivity of the intermediate map which propagates the dynamical map itself. Now, this is mathematically uh, what nowadays people define as Markovian versus non-Markovian. But a couple of years ago, actually in 2008-2009, a group of physicists started to wonder whether there was some intuition, some physical intuition behind these mathematical definitions of Markovian versus non-Markovian, okay? Is it just the form of the equation of motion or is there something physical behind? And they introduced the idea of defining non-Markovianity in terms of information backflow. So we will discuss this a little bit. We'll discuss how memory effects can be understood in terms of information backflow. I mean, you're most likely familiar with the idea of the Markovian master equation in the Lindblad form as a consequence of a number of assumptions that one performs when starting from an exact model of system plus environment. What happens is that in order to reach a master equation in the Lindblad form, one has to assume, for example, weak coupling between system and environment, and one needs to assume short leaving correlations between system and environment. This is the, the so-called Born-Markov approximation. It allows from a microscopic description to arrive to a Lindblad form master equation, but these are assumptions. So Markovian master equations are always approximations to the true exact dynamics. And nowadays, in a number of physical contexts and physical scenarios, especially in quantum technologies, it is needed to go beyond the Markovian description of the equation of motion, which works so well, for example, in quantum optics, but it doesn't work that well, for example, in solid state physics and in solid state devices. <coughs> okay, here it's not very visible, but um, what this figure should have described, you don't see the environment here, <laughs> It's just a system exchanging information uh, with an environment, and there are two types of errors. What do I want to describe with these two types of errors? The idea behind information backflow is the following. To associate Markovian dynamics to a situation in, in which the information on the system continuously and monotonically is lost into the environment because of the action of the environment that continuously monitors the system. This is what causes the coherence. However, if there are strong interactions or long-living correlations between system and environment, it could happen that some of the information that is lost from the system into the environment partly comes back. And this information backflow is what people as want to interpret as non-Markovianity. And I will um, describe briefly the first of many 
um, description of non-Markovian open quantum systems in terms of information backflow. Uh, this is the reference, um, it was in 2009, uh, from Heinz-Peter Breuer, uh, Elsie Mar uh, Marilein and Jurki Pilo. Uh, Elsie and Jurki um, are at Turku University, now uh, Elsie left uh, recently. So the idea is to define information flow. Now we are talking about the quantum information, the content of quantum, the amount of quantum information in a quantum system, right? So how do we define information in a quantum system or quantum information in a quantum system? Well, obviously there are a lot of ways of doing it. The first thing that may come to mind is von Neumann entropy. However, it turns out that this is not the best choice to relate it to the Markovian dynamics and I can explain it uh, later on uh, the reason why. So one of the um, quantifiers in quantum information theory which is extensively used to define the information or the quantum information content of a system uh, is based on distinguishability between states. So distinguishability is one half of the trace norm of the difference between two states of the system, row one and row two. And what intuitively, this, this, is, this uh, picture is just copied uh, or, or taken from uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, quantum information uh, theory book, uh, Nielsen and Chuang. And, and the idea is, of course, this is a classical uh, idea. The idea is that we, we are able to distinguish more two states if we have more information and less if we have less information. So what happens is that if I take initially two quantum states of an open quantum system, and let's assume that they are maximally distinguishable, the action of the environment will be to reduce their distinguishability and as a consequence we will lose quantum information on the system. So distinguishability is what is used, uh, one of the measures of, of uh, um, quantum information um, in an open system. Uh, and uh, it has an important property, that is contractivity. So distinguishability is contractive under completely positive and trace preserving maps. And therefore, this means that if I compare two initial states of the system with two states after a certain time, the distinguishability is always lower, is always smaller after a certain time, or this means after the action of the map, okay? And the maximum distinguishability is always the initial one. So this is a key property for connecting Markovian and non-Markovian in the sense of Lindblad, okay, to um, information backflow, okay. The, the, you have to have an in, a quantifier of information which is contractive. And distinguishability is, is one of them, it's not the only one. Von Neumann entropy is, does not have this property, okay, so you can't use actually von Neumann entropy. So this, this basically describes information loss. And of course, what happens is that now we have a trace distance and we just consider any pair of initial state and the derivative of distinguishability as a function of time, so as the states evolve, is what was defined uh, as information flow. It tells how the information content changes in time. And when the information flow is uh, um, um, smaller or equal to zero, then the dynamics is Markovian, which means that continuously I will lose information. Distinguishability is monotonically decreasing all the time, but it could happen that for certain pairs of initial states and certain time intervals, at some point I may have a partial increase of distinguishability which means information backflow, which means non-Markovian dynamics. And this is connected to the non-divisibility property I mentioned before. It's connected to the fact that, that the propagator of the dynamical map may lose complete positivity. If it loses complete positivity, trace distance may partially increase, okay? So this is the connection between Lindblad, 
Borini cosa costi su Darshan, divisibility, and information flow and backflow through contractivity of trace system. And then the same authors uh, wanted to quantify, to add the number to non-Markovianity or to information backflow, as you do with concurrence. Also concurrence is, uh, sorry, entanglement. Entanglement has many quantifiers. Concurrence is one of them, logarithmic negativity, and so on and so forth. So they introduced a number, which is non-Markovianity measure, and this number uh, is obtained as following by looking at all the intervals of time in which the information flow is positive, summing them up in this way, and then you need to maximize over all the pairs of initial states. This is because non-Markovianity is a property of the whole family of quantum channels. It's a property of the dynamical map. It must be independent on the pair of initial states. This optimization problem is generally very complicated to solve. It, it, it's not easy, okay? <coughs> okay, so the key point is the visibility of the dynamical map. And then a number of, of uh, information quantifiers have been introduced. For example, I, I mentioned the one based on trace distance, but you can use many others that are used in quantum information theory. And these are just a selection. There are many more. You can use mutual information, Fisher information, fidelity among state, entanglement with an axilla, channel capacity. All of these ways of quantifying the information on the system, they all share the same property. They are all contractive under completely positive and trace preserving maps. And therefore, a partial increase of these quantifiers signals non-divisibility and therefore memory effects. Now, please note that these are not if and only if conditions. This means that divisibility is not equivalent to non-Markovianity in terms of increase of trace distance, okay? What happens is that every time I have a partial increase, then I violate the divisibility, okay? But I can have a violation of divisibility also when I don't observe a partial increase of, of, of the quantifier. And therefore, they are all different in itself, okay? They are not the same. And, and I want to point out everything I said in a much more complete way is uh, reviewed in these uh, three recent reviews on non-Markovian open quantum system. The first one uh, is uh, mostly dedicated to the trace distance measure. This is a comparison between different measures of non-Markovianity in terms of information backflow. And here is the, the last one is more dedicated to ways of solving the dynamics uh, of non-Markovian open quantum systems and Markovian. And then very briefly, and I'm happy to discuss this more later on if you have questions, you can actually generalize the idea of non-Markovianity, not generalize, but actually define different hierarchies of non-Markovianity. And this is related to the concept of K divisibility, which is related to K positivity of the, the intermediate map, okay? So you can define a whole class of intermediate um, uh, non-Markovianity um, levels somehow. And these things have been observed in the experiments, so they are accessible experimentally, um, and there are, um, they have been studied uh, in different ways. Obviously, the, the, the clear question that you may think of why, why do you do this? I mean, why should we quantify these different degrees of non-Markovianity or non-Markovianity in itself? And I will try to answer to this question later because it turns out that memory effects can be useful in quantum technologies, okay? We will go back to this point later on. Uh, and similarly, another reference that I would like to mention here uh, has to do with the fact that there are also experimentally friendly way of detecting non-Markovianity. And, and uh, in particular, you do not need necessarily all the time to solve that complicated optimization problem that I showed before, but you can, in some cases, um, directly connect non-Markovianity measures with the measurement of certain observables uh, of the system. 
Um, I will go now to quantum reservoir engineering idea. And in particular, what I mean here with quantum reservoir engineering has to do with the fact that while the environment, quantum or classical, is always present and interacting with the system, in some cases, we could have a certain degree of accessibility to the environment. So we, cannot, we can never completely eliminate the environment, but we could be able to modify some of its property in order to, for example, increase the efficiency of a certain, a certain quantum device. Okay? And similarly, we can use reservoir engineering to do something which is a simulation of open quantum system dynamics. In cases we, we are interested in simulating, for example, non-Markovian processes. So I will, I will show you now very quickly okay, some papers that have to do with reservoir engineering and open quantum system simulators. Some old, some, some uh, new. I mean, it's a, a very quick going through. Uh, the main point will not be uh, to, to, define, to, to look at them in detail, okay? Just to say that there are theory papers as old as 1996. These are experiments from 2000. Um, again, a theory. More experiments in different physical systems. Again, different physical systems. I'm just going to go very quickly to show you that actually there has been a lot of activity both in reservoir engineering and in open quantum system um, simulation, in the proposal of simulators for open quantum systems. But all these references I showed before, they had one thing in common. And the thing that they have in common is that they all deal with Markovian open quantum systems. The reason is that the tradition of Markovian open quantum system is much longer. For, it comes really from laser cooling and quantum optics uh, initially. So, and because quantum optical systems are to a very high degree Markovian systems, it, it, it has, they have been studying much more and they are much easier to handle theoretically and analytically. Only recently, there have been the first experiments on non-Markovian open quantum systems. This is one uh, collaboration between, uh, um, between a Chinese group uh, in FA um, of uh, Chuan Peng Li uh, and uh, uh, theorists from Turku and, and uh, Freiburg. Um, later on, uh, there have been uh, uh, observations of so-called weak non-Markovianity in the group of uh, Fabio Charlino and Paolo Mataloni in Rome. This weak non-Markovianity is related to the different hierarchies of non-Markovianity that I described before to the concept of K divisibility, uh, and also some simulators of qubits, uh, quantum simulator of, of, of noisy channels, both Markovian and non-Markovian. Recently, um, together with, again, uh, the, the group of Chuan Feng Li in China, uh, we developed uh, a quantum simulator for pure dephasing, which is able to synthesize any type of spectral density. So it's, it's completely flexible in the uh, determination of the spectral density and therefore in the form of the time dependent coefficients in the master equation, positive or negative. And all these papers obviously have in common the fact that these are the first experiments of non-Markovianity, but they are also very simple models, okay? So the, the type of master equations that they are able to engineer are very simple forms of master equations. So recently, uh, we started to um, think and investigate whether we could study more complex types of quantum environments interacting uh, with open quantum system and changing their properties on demand. And we thought about cold gases. And in particular, I'm going to talk about Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian as a controllable environment for an open quantum system. And in particular, I will focus on a one-dimensional gas of cold bosonic atoms trapped in an optical lattice and confined in the lowest block band. So this is the well-known Bose-Hubbard model. The, the, um, 
example I will discuss is something that we have been doing, uh, uh, mostly my PhD student, Francesco Cosco, and my former postdoc, Massimo Borrelli, in collaboration with Francesco Plastina from the um, University of Calabria and the group of Dira Yaksh in Oxford. So this is the Hamiltonian of the Bose-Hubbard model. And here we have, uh, uh, probably many of you will be familiar with this model implemented in optical lattices. Uh, and, and here we have two main terms, one describing the on-site interaction with you, the on-site potential. And this part is describing hopping between different lattice sites with coupling strength J. And it is well known that this model is such that what, when I increase the ratio between the on-site potential and the hopping uh, potential J, there is a quantum phase transition occurring in the ground state of the Bose-Hubbard model. And in particular, when U is much smaller than J, I have, so, so therefore when hopping dominates, I have the superfluid regime in the ground state of the Bose-Hubbard model, in the opposite limit, I have Mott insulator regime. So basically, the atoms are stuck in the um, bottom of the potential well uh, of, of, uh, um, of the lattice. Now, obviously, this corresponds to a quantum phase transition be between a completely delocalized phase and a localized phase, which is the Mott insulator phase. And you know that there have been a number of experiments realizing these models and observing this quantum phase transition. Now, what we assume to do, this will be our environment, okay? So the environment we are interacting uh, now with uh, is a, a complex environment undergoing a quantum phase transition. And our system, the system, the open system that we want to consider uh, is actually um, an impurity atom trapped uh, in a, for example, optical tweezer. So we assume to have one atom in a very highly confined potential, and we consider the emotional ground state uh, of this impurity atom and two lowest internal states that I indicate with ENG. So effectively, the Hamiltonian, the effective Hamiltonian of the impurity atom is treated as a two-level system. So the initial state, so this, this is a probe uh, scenario in which I assume that I can controllably let the probe interact with the environment for the amount of time uh, I desire, okay? So initially, the state of the total system probe, probe means here, will be here my open quantum system. So probe plus environment, it's a factorized state of the ground state of the Bose-Hubbard model and the initial state of the probe which we'll assume to be, I will assume to be in a superposition, uh, equally weighted superposition of excited and ground state. These are things that can be done through Ramsey interferometry, for example, this preparation of these states. And then what happens is that we will immerse the probe in one of the um, optical lattices site. I will call it site zero. This looks tilted, uh, but I'm not, it's just, it's just an effect of the drawing. I'm not considering tilted optical lattices, but just the, normal optical lattice. And the interaction is a collision-collision um, interaction. And of course, uh, I write the interaction of Hiltonian between system and environment in this form. This is the local number operator of the Bose lattice. And this is the uh, excited state of the atom. So it's an interaction which depends on the state of the atom, which is my probe, okay? It's active only when the state is in the excited state. So the total closed system uh, is the two-level system, the environment, um, which is the Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, and the interaction, which is a collision-collision interaction of this form, right? Now, if you start from this uh, exact microscopic description of the total system, you can use uh, standard techniques of open quantum system theory, like the time convolution uh, projection operator technique, and derive a master equation for the probe only. Now this derivation is exact. And what you will find out is that because of the form of the interaction Hamiltonian I'm considering, actually the dynamics of the probe, the two-level system, is of pure dephasing form. So it's a very simple master equation, which is time local with one time-dependent coefficient, 
which is only causing dephasing. There is no energy exchange here. You can see it immediately from the form of this interaction, right? The interaction of Hamiltonian indeed is uh, commutes uh, with the system of Hamiltonian itself. And if you derive uh, exactly the master equation from the e microscopic description, you will find out that the, you can explicitly write the time dependent coefficient in terms of the density density fluctuations of the Bose gas. So now I have a microscopic form for the, uh, for the um, uh, time dependent uh, coefficient, which is here. And depending on this expression here, you may have both Markovian and non-Markovian dynamics because the time dependent coefficient can be either positive or negative. In particular, remember to study this problem, I need to solve the out of equilibrium dynamics of the full system, okay? I can do this analytically only in two regimes, superfluid and mott insulator regimes. Otherwise, I have to use numerical approaches, so-called uh, TDMRG uh, numerical uh, calculations um, that are used commonly in these systems. But let's begin uh, very briefly with the analytical solution. So in the, in the superfluid regime, I can use Bogolyubov mean field theory, and I can write explicitly this uh, coefficient in terms uh, of the Bogolyubov amplitudes, okay? So I, I don't go into the details here. I just want to tell you that it can be directly related to the microscopic um, description of, uh, of the system. Uh, in the opposite regime, uh, we have been using these uh, results um, to, to uh, solve exactly the full dynamics uh, in terms of the so-called particle hole type bosons. So you introduce Dublons and Hollands. Dublons and Hollands have to do with the fact that we consider a unit filling lattice, one atom per lattice side. When you immerse the probe and you go out of equilibrium, what can happen is that you create either two particles, Dublons in a lattice, or a hole, okay? This is you, you have these density waves propagating. And you can, once again, analytically express this time-dependent coefficient. And then again, the, then the solution of this master equation is, uh, is uh, of course, uh, a pure dephasing solution. So you can calculate the coherences, uh, which depend on these time-dependent coefficients, which in turn is related to the time-dependent decay rate. Now, this, because this can be both positive and negative, is non Markovian. There is no Limblad theorem. It may, in principle, be non physical. However, since we always use the exact full solution for the total system dynamics, of course, the reduced dynamics will always be physical because I'm solving the full closed model, okay, here. <clears throat> okay, so what happens in this case? We can introduce um, the so-called Loschmittiku. I will not say much, um, and I will not um, define it in detail because of lack of time, but I can only say that the off-diagonal elements depends on this uh, Loschmittiku, which is the overlap between the time-evolved state of the, of the gas and the initial state of the gas, meaning of the Bose-Hubbard Bose model. And what you can see is that you can calculate exactly the non-Markovianity measure. It's related to the loch mittico The loch mittico has a non-monotonic behavior, and this non-Markovianity measure sums up the intervals where the loch mittico um, increases, partly. So where, where coherences, if you don't want to think in terms of loch mittico think in terms of coherences, they are equivalent. Whenever you have a regain of coherences, then you will also have um, and this will contribute to the non, uh, to the non Markovianity measure. And now, what we plot here is uh, the non Markovianity measure in itself, uh, a renormalized non Markovianity measure in terms of information backflow, as a function of the ratio between u and j. Remember, changing u over j, I go from the superfluid to the Mott insulator regime. And what happens is that initially I have zero 
non-Markovian, okay, so the system is Markovian. Then I have a peak and then I go down. Please notice that this green curve is actually, of course, numeric because I can't go through the quantum phase transition analytically. I can only do the, uh, the two extreme regimes, superfluid and Mott insulator. And analytical results only match actually deep uh, in the Mott insulator phase. Uh, otherwise, there are differences with the uh, numerics um, as a matter of fact. So what does it mean? If I zoom in, Again, this is again a non-Markovianity major, and I'm zooming in close to what is known to be the quantum phase transition point. I will see that actually for different numbers of atoms or, or lattice size, if you want, there seems to be a consistency between Markovianity, Markovian dynamics of the probe, and superfluid phase of the environment, while the Mott insulator phase is non-Markovian. Okay, what does it mean? Well, it basically means that if I immerse a probe, an atom, in the superfluid environment, because of the delocalized phase, the information will go into the environment and never come back, okay? The density wave will be such that in the environment, information will be always going away from the system. While in the Mott insulator case, the atoms are stuck, each of them in the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, potential well, in the lattice size, one per potential well. And when I immerse the probe, because the system is more stiff, information, so the, the probe will cause a dublon holon quasi-particle wave that will be allowing a partial backflow of information, a partial return of the information into the system. Um, so there is actually this, this um, separation between superfluid as Markovian and Mott insulator as, as, as non-Markovian. Uh, in the open system dynamics. Now, we have verified this in many other systems, for example, um, systems with the disorder, aubrey andre model, and so on, on and seems to be uh, very often the case that the phase of the uh, environment induces, seems to be very strongly correlated to the induced dynamics of the probe, which also means that by using a local probe and looking at the dynamics of the local probe, I'm able to detect the quantum phase of the environment. So the quantum phase of the environment induces or is mapped into the dynamic, dynamical properties of the probe and um, in the local case. Yes, you have a question? I don't hear you, sorry, can you? Of, uh, thanks. Uh, here, uh, your superfluid phase is Markovian, mm -hmm. but you are in one dimension, so you have one uh, specific uh, spectral density. Mm -hmm. What happens when you change the spectral density and look uh, in higher dimensions? Is it still Markovian? Or I have no idea. For the Bose Hubbard model, um, I think it is, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that you it's very hard to do TDMRG for bidimensional lattices. These were already quite heavy calculations for 1D. Huh? Okay. Um, but for other systems, you can uh, investigate, yes. Uh, and I don't know, it, it will depend. I don't have an intuition about that. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'm, I should be uh, 10 minutes. That's, that's great. I think I have time then to conclude. So the question is why? I, I think I partly explained uh, due to the nature of the excitations of the many body system, why one is more supportive of an information backflow in the localized space than, uh, than the other one. But what we are, so we are going to answer to the why also by trying to identify actually what are the information carriers. And here we'll be just giving some uh, brief um, answer but of course, we have been investigating this in terms of the density 
uh, density fluctuations uh, of the uh, of the um, uh, underlying gas, which is the only way of, of understanding what is going on. Because generally it isn't easy, when you use these quantifiers of information, it isn't easy to understand whether there is a physical information <coughs> carrier or not. Okay, so first of all, we, what we notice is that the Numarkovian dynamics occurs for values of U over J for which there are these quasi-particle doublets and holons which move away from site zero where the impurity is immersed and oscillate back and forth, ac accumulate, ac and they accumulate on average on site one. So this is what our numerical analysis tells us, what is going on. Uh, and of course, these constitute the environment memory. So the information carriers seem to be, at least in this model, the quasi-particles, these doublons and holons, which are present only in the Mott insulator phase and not in the superfluid uh, phase, which is the delocalized phase. Now, some of the take-home messages. The first one is that, what does this tell us? That even if we consider a bit more complicated or less trivial types of environments, like the Bose lattices, what turns out is that they act well as non-trivial controllable environment, allowing to induce both Markovian and non-Markovian dynamics in the probe just by changing, for example, the on-site interaction or the, uh, what this means in experiments is generally um, the, the height of the potential wells of the, of the Bose lattices. The second is that it seems that there is a strong connection between the different phases of the ground state of the Bose lattice and the induced dynamics of the probe, so superfluid and Markovian and multi-insulator and non-Markovian. And the third is that we are able to identify, at least in this specific model, what are the information carriers that are this the Dublin Olin quasi-particle. Now, I will conclude briefly uh, with few ideas about exploiting now memory effects. And this is uh, something that I will uh, touch um, only, uh, and I can elaborate uh, you know, more if you are interested in uh, after during the questions. So there is this um, idea uh, that is very common in the quantum information community that the longer the system is exposed to decoherence induced by the environment, the worse it is for the quantum devices. So that's why people are working on quantum devices and quantum technologies are trying to isolate more and more the qubits and they are trying to work at shorter and shorter times to fight the decoherence, right? But this idea is something which is not general. It is something which is based on our understanding of Markovian systems, but which does not hold for non-Markovian systems, okay? And the example I, I would like to give um, to show you that actually this is not always the case is an example of quantum communication, and I will specifically plot the quantum channel capacity, which is defined as the bound on the maximum rate at which we can reliably transfer information along a noisy quantum channel, okay? I will show you just some examples of non-Markovian um, dynamics or a non-Markovian behavior in the quantum channel capacity. So this is, these are all non-Markovian examples. This is one case in which this is quantum channel capacity as a function of time. It starts decaying and then it goes back and it reaches a stationary non-zero value. This happens in cases of non-Markovian dynamics where quantum information trapping occurs. Another example is an example in which quantum channel capacity decays, goes to zero, and then has revivals. Now, this is quantum channel capacity as a function of the time or of channel length. Now, what this means is that it's not true 
the shorter time or shorter channel lengths are better. Because you see here the quantum channel capacity is zero. In the longer channel, it's non zero again. Due to memory effects, quantum information backflow, quantum channel capacity becomes non zero again. So what this means is that in the more general non Markovian case, I have to think about what is the right length or the best length of the channel to maximize quantum information transfer. Because a longer channel can work better than a shorter one. This is another example, again, in which we do have, uh, again, quantum channel tra uh, capacity trapping, and I will not um, describe, it, uh, describe it in detail. So there are, um, I'm just very briefly giving here some uh, references about applications of quantum non-Markovian and memory effect dynamics uh, to different fields, okay? It goes from uh, quantum speed limit to controlling ent entropic uncertainty relation to super dense coding to teleportation, quantum key distribution, and also to thermodynamic um, um, examples and approaches. And they all show that in the non-Markovian case, we have to pay special care compared to the Markovian case in defining what is optimal to achieve a certain task, okay? And often this is, this is counterintuitive with respect to what we think. So what happens is that we may ask if something comes back due to memory effect, if quantum information comes back, if entanglement comes back, if coherences come back, can I consider memory effects and non-Markovianity as a resource for quantum information theory and for quantum technologies? And the answer to this question is, well, actually I can give you two answers. <laughs> the first one is that it is not generally known whether it can, whether it can be a resource theory of non-Markovianity. I've seen recently a paper on the archive which is actually claiming to have achieved a resource theory of non-Markovianity. But what I know for sure is that there are a number of examples in which actually the absence of memory effects is better with respect to the presence of memory effects. So if I have the possibility of tuning uh, a, a knob and going from Markovian to non-Markovian dynamics, and I compare the non-Markovian with the Markovian, in certain, for certain tasks, the Markovian is actually better than the non-Markovian. And, um, well, the example that I will not discuss about, but I will just give you the uh, reference, is dynamical decoupling. This is one example in which you, you can show that an initially Markovian environment gives a higher efficiency uh, than the uh, non-Markovian one. Again. So finally, reservoir engineering allows to controllably manipulate information flow and memory effects, and this obviously can be useful to optimize efficiency in quantum devices. If we cannot get rid of the environment, we can at least, in a system-dependent case, obviously, try to use and exploit uh, this possibility. For certain tasks, memory effects are useful, but there exist also counterexamples. They can also be a disadvantage. So generally, the idea that the longer the system is exposed to the environment, the more quantum is destroyed is not true. I mean, it's only valid for Markovian cases, but if we generalize, it turns out that it's more complicated than that. And I just wanted to uh, briefly show uh, my, my, uh, the picture of my group, and in particular, I acknowledge Francesco, my PhD student, who, have been, uh, who has been mostly working on the Bose-Hubbard uh, um, Bose model and dynamics. And with this, I thank you for your attention. So, so you had this, uh, this uh, rate of... Uh, information flow that you call sigma, I think, 
which in principle should be negative, but you said that sometimes with non-Marcovanity can be, for short times, can be positive. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot like irreversibility uh, in, in classical or quantum thermodynamics in the sense that irreversibility should be an increasing function of time, but we know with fluctuation theorems that this, this guy can actually sometimes be uh, decreasing. Uh, for some short period of time, is it something that, uh, that is... It is not directly connected um, because, well, I mean, in most of these examples, the systems are truly irreversible uh, in all cases. And you can have information flow or backflow in truly irreversible systems in any case. Um, there is a connection in, in a way, so you can define some entropic measures of information flow. Uh, one that has been considered and studied is um, a relative entropy. It has some disadvantages, but there are technical disadvantages because relative entropy between two states, well, diverges for, for um, orthogonal states. That's why it's not been used extensively. Um, so it is, it is, even when I consider finite systems, for example, when I looked at the Bose-Hubbard model, of course, I generally have a finite environment there. But we always look at times which are shorter than the recurrences because we want to quantify what we call the non-trivial information backflow. There is a trivial information backflow in a finite environment which just comes back from the fact that the density wave reaches the boundaries and comes back. So obviously these are, there are Poincaré times. I mean, but but we are not looking at that. We are just looking at uh, shorter times. Uh, so the, the memory effects there come from the long-living correlations between the system or the probe and the environment. So it's the main. It, it's, it is the correlations and not the coupling because we are still in weak coupling in these examples. Uh, how do your results for the bose hubbard model depend on the strength of the coupling uh, between the impurity and the environment? Because naively, uh, I would guess that if the, this uh, coupling uh, becomes very weak, then it, it should become Markovian. Uh, well, this we are we are still here working on weak coupling, but you can see. Uh, well, it depends. We work both at weak coupling and at, uh, at strong couplings. It uh, I can show you uh, the formula here. So it's basically uh, you see in. Uh, it is really not um, not um, truly uh, dependent on. I think at least here you can see it. Uh, this is the superfluid case. So th this UE is the coupling strength between system and environment. So this UE, oh no, this is, uh, okay, sorry, is the other, uh, so this is the um, uh, motinsulator case. And uh, UE appears both in the, uh, both in the two limits uh, as a coupling, um, so as a front factor uh, in the decay rates, okay? So it increases the value of the decay rate, but it does not change uh, the um, um, non-Markovian character. And this is true uh, also in the superfluid phase, which is here. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, this is, this is also the case because, so I think what you have in mind uh, and what, what, is, what happens, for example, in uh, Janice Cummings' model and so on, where you increase the coupling and, and you have uh, no, uh, change to non-Markovianity, but this is because you have energy exchange between system and environment. Here you don't have any energy exchange, so here is pure dephasing. So if you think about one atom coupled to a uh, quantum, uh, so say to the vacuum of the electromagnetic field in a cavity, okay, cavity QED example, one atom in a cavity and you have uh, the Lorentzian shape of the, of the, of the cavity mode, uh, mm, and interacting uh, resonant with the two-level atom. There you do have exchange of energy, obviously, between the system and the photon, which is the cavity mode. And there, uh, obviously, you do have non-Markovianity, which increases if you increase the strength of the coupling. So what you say is true in that model, but not in this one, because this is not a, dis uh, I mean, the way in which I understand it is that because this is not a dissipative or energy exchanging model here, the mechanism is different, it's pure dephasing. So actually the coupling strain doesn't play here a key role. What plays a key role is the correlations between system and environment, which are uh, incorporated uh, here. Uh, here. They are incorporated in this density-density correlation here. Okay. This tells you the, the correlation time, the, the typical correlation time uh, of the environment. The environment is, is the 
Bose Hubbard model here. And, and this plays a role in defining whether you have a positive or a negative decay rate. Um, so you mentioned that you might say something about K divisibility. Um, so does it mean that the kth power of the propagator is then uh, positive, or does it mean uh, that uh, in a Markov chain picture, uh, the, the probabilities at a certain st time step depend on the k previous time steps, or are these two related? Uh, thanks. This is a very good question. Now, the first thing I should say is that the concept of Markovianity of the quantum dynamical map is rather different compared to the classical uh, definition and, and concept of Markovianity in the classical uh, systems. The reason is that uh, you, in quantum case or in quantum dynamics, you cannot really define in a measure independent way conditional probabilities, okay? And, and this creates a problem because you, you, you can only define them when you define the measurement, okay? And, and this is, you know, it, it makes it um, very difficult to create an analogy between classical and quantum non-Markovianity, although there are works uh, on that. So what I mean with k-divisibility, going back to, this, uh, to your question, is the following thing. So if, if we go at the very beginning, mm, when I introduce the dynamical map and the propagator, so I, I, I said uh, that this uh, divisibility means that this dynamical map, uh, so this propagator is completely positive. Completely positive means that not only this is positive, but also if you consider the tensor product between this object and identity in an extension of n uh, uh, dimension, it is will be positive for all n. So it's positive for all the extensions. So if you consider this tensor identity k, for all k's, uh, the extension of the map uh, is positive. This, this is the definition of complete positivity. Now k, k divisibility means not complete positivity, but k positivity of the map. This means that if you consider this tensor product identity till k, um, this is positive until k, and it loses positivity after k. Uh, if I had a board, I could show you. I mean, uh, it is uh, difficult to, but it's, it's just that instead of considering uh, complete positivity is, is, um, is, is uh, k positivity for all k from one to infinity, while uh, uh, k positivity is positivity until k, with tensor product identity one, two, three, k. And similarly, uh, CP divisibility means complete positivity uh, of this, and k divisibility means k positivity of this, of the intermediate map, basically. So you, you define in this way these hierarchies, mathematically, they are all mathematical things, yeah. Thanks again, uh, Sabrina. Thank you.